The son of immigrants fleeing Ireland's potato famine, he was born in 1858 in the southern neighborhood of Boston, a hotbed of gang violence at the time. This roughneck, no holds environment would breed one of the toughest men to ever walk the earth. His name was John Lawrence Sullivan. The boisterous, womanizing Irishman had a love for fighting matched only by his thirst for drink. He claimed he could lick any man in the house. Undeniably a giant of sports history, he would usher boxing into the mainstream, bringing it from an illegal back alley brawling spectacle to America's most popular sport, where thousands would gather to watch. But how did Sullivan develop into such a superstar during a time when an American identity was still trying to find itself? Sullivan became a superstar, the first real American icon, during a time of explosive growth for the country. Millions of migrants were moving across the Atlantic, many of them disenfranchised with little to aspire to. Sullivan gave many the hope that they needed, especially in the Irish-American community. Here was this, the son of poor migrants from Ireland, developed into one of the toughest men in the world that struck a chord with many Americans seeking a figure to look up to. His legacy has largely been forgotten by the general public today, mainly because of the generational gap of his era to modern times, and the foreshadowing of more recent titans like Muhammad Ali, Joe Lewis, and Mike Tyson. But had it not been for Sullivan, the sport these men would grow to dominate would very likely have not existed at all or at least would be unrecognizable as we know it today. When he began to box, the rules that were around back then, the London prize ring rules, were brutal and loosely enforced. There were no sanctioning bodies, no commissions, and dirty fighting was encouraged. Techniques such as eye gouging and hair pulling were often used. In addition, the idea of rounds was completely foreign to our idea of them today. They lasted until a man was knocked down that could be as short as 30 seconds or as gruelingly long as 30 minutes. It was simple. Men would fight until one could no longer continue or until the police arrived to halt the contest. There was no technical knockouts, no decisions. John L. fought under both the London Prize Rules and the Marquis of Queensbury. His last fight fought under the London Prize Ring Rules was against Jake Kilrain in the woods. This 75 round war would last three grueling hours, and after over 80 knockdowns, Kilrain was unable to continue, and Sullivan retained his position. After this exhausting battle, Sullivan would insist on using the Marquis of Queensbury rules. This decision would propel boxing on the path to its current form that we all know today. Under these new public-friendly rules, Sullivan found great success and fame. He toured the country in what was kind of a come-one-come-all takers challenge. Any man could challenge John L. with the potential of a lucrative purse if any man could beat him. None succeeded. Eventually, after more than 200 contests, John would begin to lose focus, spending more of his pre-fight time drinking himself into stupors and showboating his extravagant wealth than actually training. And by the time he fought gentleman Jim Corbett, he was merely a shell of the former Boston strong boy who had dominated the sport for years. In their fight, the slow, out of shape Sullivan found himself unable to catch the fast moving, quick hitting Corbett. And after 21 rounds of cat and mouse, Corbett would hit Sullivan with a devastating cross that left him down and out. John had struggled his entire life with alcoholism. This affected his personal and professional life. At home, he was a wife beater and nearly drank himself to death on several occasions. His love for alcohol was so intense, he even opened his own salon. On one occasion, he was arrested for knocking out his own horse after he deemed the beast disobedient. Eventually, his marriage fell apart, and in the ring, his bad behavior began to chip away at his reputation, with one of his matches at Madison Square Garden being cancelled after he showed up to the bout belligerently drunk, refusing to fight. After 20 whole years of alcohol abuse and spending nearly half his fortune on drink, he would quit drinking in 1905 and live the rest of his days a sober man and an advocate for temperance. Overweight and unhealthy from a long life of overindulging in food and drink, as well as from the effects of prize fighting. Sullivan died at the age of 59 with barely $10 in his pocket. Sullivan was inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame in 1990 as a member of the Hall's original class. His official record of 40 wins, 1 loss, and 2 draws with 34 knockouts is by no means a reflection of the man's actual ability. He fought well over 200 fights, being only defeated once. The barn where Sullivan trained still stands in the small town of Belfast, New York, and is now the Bare Knuckle Boxing Hall of Fame. Being a larger-than-life character, Sullivan attracted great attention. Despite their vastly different upbringings, the aristocratic Theodore Roosevelt and the working class Sullivan, born just 15 days apart, shared a love of boxing and a disdain for the Molly Coddles. While in the White House, Roosevelt continued to box until a punch from a sparring partner left him nearly blind in his left eye. In the sweet science, much to the First Lady's disdain, was a frequent dinnertime conversation topic. Roosevelt had particular esteem for Sullivan, whom he considered as game and straight and honest a fighter as who would ever step in the ring and their mutual admiration morphed into friendship. John L. visited the White House on several occasions and presented the president with a gold-mounted rabbit's foot that Roosevelt carried with him on a safaris to Africa. He frequently crossed paths with other celebrities of the times, such as Buffalo Bill, who in St. Louis in 1884 invited Sullivan to watch his Wild West show. 
Decades later in 1908, Sullivan met Cody outside Boston and revisited old times for two hours over tall cans of ginger ale as costume cowboys and Native Americans hovered to listen to their anecdotes. His legacy will go down in legend as the father of modern boxing and the first American superstar. His struggle with alcohol and superstardom serve as an example to all who may one day come to be tempted by extravagance. Rest in peace, John L. Sullivan. Sullivan was like a rock star of the time, under the name of the Boston Strongboy. The first professional athlete to make a million dollars, reportedly. He performed in vaudeville and hung out with some of the most iconic figures of this gilded age, from presidents and kings to Wild West gunslingers. Sullivan made countless public appearances and even at one time considered running for United States Senate. In 1887, thousands of Doran fans crowded the way to the Nascantlet Beach to glimpse the heavyweight champion of the world, John L. Sullivan, with his gold-plated belt. Depending on what you read, Sullivan was first considered world heavyweight champion in either 1888 when he fought Charlie Mitchell in France, or 1889 when he knocked out Jay Kilrain in round 75 of a scheduled 80 round bout. It's hard to say with some of the history of John L. Sullivan what's true and what's a fallacy, but he certainly did bring the sport of boxing to the masses. It's maybe just a shame that over a hundred years later, the memory of the man was bastardised by Bobby Gunn when he set about building himself as the new John L. Sullivan, complete with replica belts. Nevertheless, it does prove to show just how big this whole thing was at the time. Fast forward to the 14th of November 1942, and we will see John L. Sullivan depicted in the Errol Flynn movie, Gentleman Jim. In the name of the movie, obviously referring to James Corbett, who famously was the one that beat John L. Sullivan to become heavyweight champion of the world. I had it a long time. Take good care of it, will you? In 1882, the famous English writer, Oscar Wilde, came 4,000 miles to Mississippi it cost him a boat ticket and two weeks time. In 1882, the famous New York minister, Henry Ward Beecher, came a thousand miles to Mississippi. It cost him a railroad ticket and three days time. And in 1882, this infamous man came only 400 miles to Mississippi. It almost cost him his life. Wanted in seven states, dead or alive, a $10,000 reward on his head. But Jesse James risked his life, left his hideout in St. Joseph, Missouri, rode 400 dangerous miles to the south, leaving Missouri, passing through Arkansas, down to Mississippi City, Mississippi. What drew a writer, a preacher, and an outlaw to this remote place? They all came to see the Boston strong boy, John L. Sullivan, challenged for the heavyweight championship of the world. This is the man Sullivan has to beat, bare-knuckle champion Irish Paddy Ryan. Wax on his mustache, but iron in his fists. On February 8, 1882, Irish Paddy stalked into the ring to, as he put it, dispense with this boy Sullivan. For eight rounds, Sullivan and Ryan clubbed away at each other. Then suddenly in the ninth round, the upstart challenger smashed his fist to Ryan's jaw and John L. Sullivan became the new bare-knuckle champion of the world. Two months after the fight, Robert Ford shot Jesse James in the back of the head while Jesse was hanging a picture in his home in St. Joseph, Missouri. 1882. America was in the second half of a 200-year boom that would take it from a weakling colony to world power. Football had just been invented, and baseball pitchers were still throwing underhand. Boxing was illegal in most of the country, but Americans loved it. It was the spectator sport, Americana in the raw. Calling the 1882 brand of boxing a sport is really a kindness. Barely organized mayhem would be closer. 
Bouts were held in bar rooms, on barges, and deep in the backwoods. Wrestling and gouging were commonplace with no gloves on the hands. The brawls also had no time limits. They usually ended with the stronger man having literally disabled his opponent. And in 1882, John Lawrence Sullivan had proved that he could probably, as he put it, lick any son of a bitch in the world. At five foot 10 inches, he was not quite a giant, but in his first seven years as champion, Sullivan overwhelmed all of his 23 opponents in six rounds or less. He drank under the table all those men he didn't fight. Here is John L. without his handlebar mustache, posed in front of his favorite hangout, a saloon. But in 1888, a threat appeared in Sullivan's rosy future. Jake Kilrain, who figured he could easily beat the rum-soaked champion. The Sullivan-Kilrain fight is the most famous bare-knuckle contest ever held. These are the first photographs ever taken of a fight. These are the only photographs of a bare-knuckle contest. These are the only visual records of John L. Sullivan in action. 23rd round. Middle of the Mississippi woods. Temperature 100 degrees. The roughneck crowd didn't have to pay. All the money to be made on the fight was in the $10,000 side bet between Sullivan and Kilrain. The man with the shaved head is the world wrestling champion and Sullivan's trainer, Wild William Muldoon. Notice John L's gloveless right hand. By the way, they are not fighting on canvas, but on good old American dirt. 75th round. Two hours and 16 minutes after it began, the savage fighting ends under the broiling Mississippi sun. Jake Kilrain lies on the ground, too battered to rise. The great Sullivan Kilrain fight is over. It will be the last championship fight fought with bare knuckles. Soon after the fight, the victorious Sullivan had a surprise in store for him. It took 16 brave men in blue to arrest the feared champion for having engaged in an illegal prize fight. Things in the world of boxing were soon about to change. 